I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. To begin with, I want us to read just the first two verses, then we plan to go through the entire chapter. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. I want to talk to you tonight about better, the key to understanding the Old Testament. I want to talk to you about better than Moses. Right now, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I ask that you'll speak to us through it this evening. Give us an understanding. We need an understanding. Guide us by your spirit into all truth and forgive us anything that would stand in the way of your blessing us and helping us. Lord, we trust this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you just a minute about Moses. Moses was unquestionably one of the greatest men who ever lived. I've, I've often said, Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 opens with the Lord saying, Moses, my servant is dead. And he calls Joshua to replace Moses. And I, I have not yet, in many decades of reading that, I've never gotten over how overwhelmed Joshua must have felt to be called on to replace Moses. Now, he knew Moses. He had worked with Moses. He's Moses' minister, the Bible says. <clears throat> and that doesn't mean he was his pastor. It means he was his servant. And he served Moses. And he fought with Moses. He fought for Moses. He fought for the people of Israel. But then he's called. But Moses is called in that same verse, Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, the servant of the Lord. He's known throughout history as the great lawgiver, although the law that he gave was not his, but God's. He was a leader of God's people. He led them out of Israel. I'm sorry, I meant to say out of Egypt. He led Israel out of Egypt. And slavery and bondage in Egypt led them for 40 years through the promised land. Now, that's, that's a tough task for anybody because we don't know the exact number of the population there, but it was... It's estimated to be in the millions. And Moses led these people. Now, I said he led them for 40 years, but you have to understand something. He went to uh, Egypt. He left Egypt, I should say, uh, and went to his father-in-law's place when he was 40 years old. When he went back to Egypt, he was 80 after he led the people of Israel for 40 years, he was 120 years old. You know what the Bible says? His eye was not dimmed and his strength was not diminished. Can you imagine that? I'm, I'm not near 120. My eye is dimmed and my strength is diminished. So I, I can't imagine that. It's wonderful. He was the leader of God's people. And then... Don't miss this. He was the human author of the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I think it's safe to say that there's never been another man quite like him. But, with all that said, when Jesus came, he was greater than Moses. And I'm sure even Moses would agree with that. So take a look, if you will, at verse 1 again. The writer of Hebrews says, Wherefore, holy brethren. Wherefore. What does he mean, wherefore? Well, he tells us in this. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So wherefore, because Jesus is our high priest, and our high priest is the one who goes to God on our behalf. Any priest, that's the definition of a priest, is one who goes to God on behalf of the people. Now, I am not a priest in the sense that many would call themselves a priest. Uh, we believe here, and it's taught in Scripture, and perhaps another night we'll be able to look at that in the Bible, that 
uh, we believe in the priesthood of the believer. What does that mean? That means you don't need me or anybody else to go to God on your behalf. You can go directly to God yourself. You can pray. You can talk to God. You can bring your request to God, and you can expect to hear from God. You have a personal relationship with him. You don't have to go through any other human being. But in the Old Testament economy, they had priests, and then they had the high priest. And the high priest was obviously over all of the other priests, but his primary job was to take the blood of a sacrificed animal in and put it on the mercy seat inside the Holy of Holies. And he was the only person who was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. And then, not whenever he chose, but only on one day after a blood sacrifice had been made. Now the high priest there pictured our Lord Jesus Christ. And here, the writer of Hebrews tells us that he is our high priest. So because of all this, look at verse 1 again. He says, wherefore, holy brethren, that's you and I. We are the holy brethren. Oh, I thought the holy brethren, that was somebody on a much higher plane. No, that's you and I. You and I are the holy brethren. If you are one who has trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you've been born again, you've been brought in the family of God, you are one of the holy brethren. And thank God for it. Brothers and sisters in the family of God who have been cleansed and set apart for his service. The word for that is sanctified. We've been sanctified. We've been cleansed and set apart for his service. That's what makes us holy brethren. We didn't do that. We trusted him and he did that. And then look at verse 1 again. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Partakers of the heavenly calling. So we are to follow and serve the Lord Jesus. We are called to follow and serve the Lord Jesus. And we're all part of the same company of people who have been called out of and away from this world and to the service of the Lord. There's, there's a Greek word that's translated in the New Testament multiple times, over a hundred times. This word is used and translated in the New Testament to describe those people who the Lord has called out of and away from this world to himself to serve him. These are the holy brethren, and these are the those of the heavenly high calling. And who are they? Well, that Greek word is the ecclesia, or in English, the church. That's who the holy brethren are. And that's who has the heavenly calling. We'll say more about that calling a little bit later. But then, in verse 1, he says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, consider, think about this, take notice of it, spend some time, meditate on it. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Consider the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, the apostle and high priest. Well, first of all, he's called the apostle. Well, I thought the apostles were those people who followed him. Well, you're, you're correct in that. But they are apostles because they are the ones that he commissioned to go out and preach his gospel. Because the word apostle means sent one. Now, Brother John R. Himes, who we supported for 33 years, or most of that 33 years, I should say, while he was a missionary in Japan, stood right over here and was teaching one day, and he said, I'm an apostle. And my eyes, brows raised a little bit, and uh, he explained that. He said, I'm a missionary. I've been sent out on a mission. And I've been sent out on a mission to preach the gospel of Christ and to establish churches and to bring people to the Lord. He said, and that's what the word apostle means. So he was not saying that he was one of the twelve. He was not implying that he uh, was part of some apostolic succession where that was title was passed down to him through the ages. There are folks who believe that. There are folks who call themselves apostles and they say they have 
received the titles, been passed down through the, the thousands of years, and it came to them, and they are now an apostle. I don't see anything in the Bible that teaches that, but there's folks who claim it. But I want to tell you this. The Lord Jesus is an apostle in that he is the sent one. He is not a sent one. An apostle is a sent one, but he is the sent one. He was the one sent into the world. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 1, 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he was sent here. Never lose sight of that. And it says he is the apostle and high priest of our profession. Again, the high priest, one who goes to God for us as our representative because we are not holy enough to appear before God. But he goes in with the blood of the sacrifice and he is accepted. Notice here, it doesn't say Jesus Christ. It says Christ Jesus. Well, the writer here get it backwards. No, he didn't get it backwards. Uh, well, which one's correct? Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus? Yes. They're both correct. Okay. You, some of you are not old enough to remember this, and, and I'm afraid some of us are so old we've forgotten about it. But uh, there, there was a uh, commercial decades ago on television and two people would come out and one of them would say certs is a breath mint and the other one would say certs is a candy mint and they'd argue certs is a breath mint no certs is a candy mint and somebody would come out and say stop you're both right well whether you say Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus don't argue about it because you're both right you see Christ is his title and it means the anointed one it means the savior it is the equivalent in Greek of the Hebrew Mashiach, or we would say Messiah, it's the same title. Messiah, Christ, the same title. Now, what is that title in English? Well, Christ, we, we carry it over Christos from the Greek, but uh, really we would say Savior. It's all the same idea. Messiah, Christ, Savior, all the same title, all the same idea. So our Savior, Jesus or Jesus our Savior. And then that name, Jesus. The name Jesus literally means Jehovah is Savior. That's why in Isaiah 43, we read where Jehovah says, I, even I, am the Lord or Jehovah. Beside me, there is no Savior. So again, either Jehovah and Jesus are the same or else Jesus is not the Savior. And there are few people who believe the Bible at all who will deny that Jesus is the Savior. There are people who deny the deity of Christ who still say that he's the Savior. They ought not to deny the deity of Christ because in so doing they negate his work as the Savior, but they often don't realize that. Who, verse 2, the pronoun who refers to Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now, what does that verse mean? Well, let's talk about it for a minute. Jesus is faithful to his father and the mission that his father sent him to do. He's faithful to him that appointed him. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. What does it mean Moses was faithful in all his house? Well, Moses represents as the leader, as the head, the nation of Israel. But Christ is the architect and builder of the house. We see that in verse 3. For this man, speaking of the Lord Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Jesus is counted as worthy of more glory than Moses? Yes. This man is counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Now, why is it calling him this man? We'll, we'll get to that before we're finished. This man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. Well, what is he saying here? He's saying the Lord Jesus is the builder of the house, and so as he's the builder of the house, God is uh, the builder of all things, and therefore Christ is God. Verse 5, 
And Moses barely was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. So he was a testimony of things to come. Who was Moses? And he was faithful and he was a servant. So Moses served his purpose as a faithful, obedient messenger of God and as the leader of the people of Israel. But in verse 6, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope that uh, firm unto the end. I just want to turn to a verse here. It really just came to my mind and I don't have it in my notes. So I'm just going to turn over here and find it and share it with you very quickly. Just a moment. It has to do with exactly what we're talking about. It is First Timothy chapter three and verse fifteen. So just back a few pages from where we are. First Timothy chapter three, verse fifteen. Paul writes and he says, But if I tarry long, if I'm long in coming to you, Timothy, if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Now, don't you think a young man ought to know how to behave himself in the house of God? Wouldn't you agree with that? Sure, absolutely. So let's start the verse again. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the what? Church. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So this house of God that we're talking about, the house that Christ built, do you remember in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Who's the builder? Jesus. Who's the architect? Jesus. Whose house is it? Jesus. So this is what it's saying in verse 6, but Christ has a son over his own house, Whose house are we? Because the church, you know, is not the building. The church, you know, is the people. So is Christ a son over his own house? Whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, verse 7, as the Holy Ghost hath uh, saith, today... If you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now, what is that talking about? Well, here, the writer of Hebrews is quoting from Psalm 95. And these two verses, verse 7 and 8 and following, are from Psalm 95, verses 7 and 8. The writer of Hebrews is testifying here to the inspiration of scriptures. In, in verse 7, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, in saying the scripture, Psalm 95 is inspired. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now, what is this provocation that he's talking about? Well, I'm going to turn to it very quickly here and just share with you from Numbers chapter 14. This, this will not be on the screen. So Numbers chapter 14, and listen carefully as I read to you from verse 22. Numbers 14, verse 22. Well, let me start at verse 21. But truly as I have lived, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because of all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now in these times, ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, 
him will I bring into the land wherein he went, whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn unto you and get you into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me, saying to them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to the, your whole number from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Notice how he delineates. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness, and they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. What was the occasion of all this? Remember when they were about to enter the promised land, and they sent 12 men, one of each of the 12 tribes of Israel, to spy out the land, and 10 men came back and said, oh, this is horrible place, it's frightening, it's terrible, there are giants in the land, and this land will swallow us up alive. But Joshua and Caleb came back and said, what are you talking about? It's a good land. It's a wonderful, a land that flows with milk and honey. You know, they talked about great grapes, uh, uh, great clusters of grapes. Do you know if you look at the seal of modern day Israel, on that seal, you'll find two men each on with one end of a staff on their shoulder, and they're carrying between them on that staff a big cluster of grapes, almost as big as they are. Where'd they get that picture from? From the grapes that Joshua and Caleb saw. Who are those two men? Well, I've never heard anybody say, but I wouldn't be surprised if they represent Joshua and Caleb. Now, just keep that in mind as we go back to Hebrews. And, and we're not going to be much longer here, so please bear with me. In verse 9, Hebrews 3 and verse 9, When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about how the people tempted God, and they saw his judgment, and they spent 40 years watering the wilderness. He had brought them to the promised land. They rejected it. They rejected God's offer. And so he sentenced them to wandering 40 years in the wilderness. But the problem was, as it always is with people, it was in the heart of the people. And the rest that they could not enter into was the promised land. So we're told in verses 12 and 13, which we just read, that we are supposed to learn from the experience of Israel in Moses' day. We are to encourage each other each day. He warns us about an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from trusting the living God. And we are to encourage each other every day not to allow our heart to be hardened and not to be deceived by the sin of unbelief. We'll say more about that in a moment. That's the third time I've said that, and I, I haven't forgotten. We're going to wrap it all up here in just momentarily. 
verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. What does that mean? Well, he says we're partakers of Christ. As the body is one, Paul writes, and hath many members, and all members of the one body are many, are being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. And that's from Romans, I'm sorry, from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So he says, again, in verse 15, if you look at it, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. You hear his voice. It's a warning to the New Testament believer. Hear his voice. Listen to the word of God. Hear and obey the voice of God and harden not your hearts. Don't be like those who missed out on the promised land because they hardened their heart and did not believe as in the day of provocation. An example I just read to you in Numbers 14. In verse 16, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt. What do you mean not all that came out of Egypt? Well, we read it in Numbers 14. You see, Caleb and Joshua had not hardened their hearts. And Caleb and Joshua, of the adults who left Egypt, everybody 20 years old and up, they were the only ones who lived to see the promised land. Well, what about Aaron, Moses' brother? No. What about Miriam, his sister? She didn't. What about Moses? He didn't. Not for the same reason, but he didn't enter the promised land. He didn't got to see it, but he didn't enter it. Only Joshua and Caleb, of all the people who left Egypt as an adult, entered in the promised land. Well, who, who was left? Their children and grandchildren. They got to inherit the promise. Not everyone in Moses' day hardened their heart. But the majority of them did. Now, I want to share something with you. God is always faithful. And God always has a faithful remnant of believers who will love him and who will serve him and will carry out his purpose. Verses 17 and 19, and we're finished. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in because of, what's the last word? Unbelief. Unbelief. With whom was God grieved? With those who didn't believe. And he swore to them that they would not enter into the promised land. When God rescued the people of Israel from slavery and bondage in Egypt, that was a real story. And it happened to real people just exactly the way you read about it in the scripture. Don't, don't lose that thought. But it was also a picture. It was a picture of deliverance of the believer from the slavery and bondage of sin to be taken to the promised land. Now, we have no record of anybody doing what I'm about to say. But if any of those people of Israel had said when Moses started leading people out, I don't believe what God has said, and I'm not following this guy Moses. What would have happened to them? They would have been left behind in Egypt. Now, again, we don't read of anybody doing that, but if they had, that's what would have happened. You see, Moses was a picture of the Savior who would redeem the people who, who would believe in the Lord. But Jesus is not the picture. Jesus is the actual person. So Hebrews is the key to understanding the Old Testament. And the key word in the book of Hebrews is better. Moses was a great man. As I said earlier, not been another man like him probably in all history. 
He's a great leader. And God used him to do miraculous things. He used him to write scripture. But when all that's said and done, he was still a man. Jesus Christ referred to himself as the son of man, but that, that means that he was, was born of a human mother. He did have a human body just like you and I have. But he was the second Adam, and as such, he was the representative of the human race. He's also the Son of God. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus commanded his disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now listen to that again. Baptizing them in the name, not the names, not plural, singular in the one name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, he is the Son of God, but he is also God. We're told in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, we saw it a couple Wednesday nights ago, he is the Son of God, who being the brightness of his glory, God's glory, and the express image of his person, he's the visible form of God, he came into this world. And if Moses were here tonight, if he came and spoke to us, we'd probably all faint. But, it, but if he came and spoke to us, we ought to all pay attention. You know what he'd tell you? He'd tell you Jesus Christ was better than him. Well, where, where did you get that idea? Well, listen to this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. You understand what Jesus said there? John the Baptist is the greatest man ever lived. That's really saying something. You know what John the Baptist said? In John 3.30, he said of Jesus, He must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus said he's the greatest man to ever live. John said he must increase. John must decrease. And I'm pretty sure Moses would tell you the same thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for the folks gathered here tonight. And Lord, it is my prayer that you would help us to give our hearts completely over to our Savior and to serve him as our Lord. Help us, Lord, to be faithful witnesses, faithful and true in all that we do. Now, use us as we go our separate ways. Be with those whose hearts are hurting tonight. And bring us back together again in Jesus' name. Amen.